Thank you very much, Michael, for accepting our invitation to be here with us and share your thoughts and reflections about how to introduce a new approach uh, when we are teaching operations management. Uh, you have several publications, papers with impact factor and several and a book, a very interesting book. And um, when you are uh, talking about how to introduce a new uh, approach uh, when teaching business education, you are, uh, you are covering um, or you are saying that different, uh, different approaches have different uh, underlying assumptions about human beings, right? Correct. So if you can elaborate a little bit more, what are the underlying assumptions in the economistic model the, the, the one that is more uh, widely adopted mm -hmm. and the new humanistic um, or the it's, it's not new you have been talking already mm. several years about the humanistic approach what are the underlying assumptions in both the approaches well thank you so much for this invita invitation christina and uh Hello to everybody out there. I am typically in the management discipline, but I would see management with a capital M as something that actually does potentially apply to operations management as well. So the question that you're asking, Christina, in a way that, um, what is the underlying assumption? I think it matters for pretty much all of social sciences and beyond. Uh, and so uh, what we know is the typical uh, go-to straw man uh, if we have that question of who we are as people is uh, what was formulated in economics, which is human beings as market players. And then it is actually potentially quite accurate to describe them as utility maximizers. So in market situations, we can be utility maximizers if the only thing that counts is price. On the other hand, we know that markets aren't the only organizing mechanism that we have <laughs> as managers. There are many others. Uh, and uh, we don't go into that, but we also know that we're not just operating in, uh, in a utility maximizing fa uh, fashion. And especially if we look through an evolutionary lens, which the humanistic approach does, uh, and then connects it with what E.O. Wilson says is the consilience of knowledge, so that the ancient wisdom traditions actually very much align with the evolutionary insights about who we are as human beings. And so the best distillation that I've found is that um, the traditional dominant model that I call economistic assumes we just want more. And that is maximization strategies. And typically more is something that we can quantify and measure. The alternative model will tell you, of course, that's not all, because if we want more and growth is the ultimate sort of strategy of us, we would all be dead. We would be physically fat to the degree that we couldn't walk anymore. And in fact, that's, you can see that that's part of the, the problem that we're facing as a species, uh, that we're not very healthy if we just want more. So in fact, for evolutionary purposes, we want better. Uh, that's a very uh, small distinction, but more and better is not the same. But better is what is evolutionary advantageous. And then, surprisingly, Darwin already pointed that out and is oftentimes misunderstood. We as a species benefit from being ethical and moral and creating norms that actually are rooted deeply within us in a way as a shortcut for allowing us to live in society. Because we are a fundamentally social species. The economistic model actually looks at us as individuals, separate from others, and individually maximizing as amoral, as amoral beings. So we do apparently not care about others. And quite uh, obviously that is sometimes the case, but it is not what has allowed us to survive overall. So the care, the norms of reciprocity, the norms of the golden rule are actually foundational to our survival. And that understanding is only coming up recently and is now more and more prevalent, I think, for operations management as much as it is for other management as well. So there are uh, different ways of looking at that. The humanistic model is looking at homo sapiens versus the economistic model is looking as, at uh, homo economicus. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I see. So 
Uh, homo economicus is individualistic, rational, uh, profit ma looks for profit maximization, and amoral. Right? Amoral. Amoral. Um, it doesn't mean immoral. immoral. Right? It means it has no concern of whether the things you do actually matter to anybody else other than, than that, right? So there is no concern for that. And in the humanistic approach, the, humanistic, the, the human being is social, not individual, right. Mm -hmm. is uh, emotional, in addition also, to rational. In addition, right? Uh -huh. In addition. And is moral, right? And uh, looks for a balance, as you were mentioning, right? Right. right. Oh, getting a little bit more in depth into the, into the drives, okay? Mm -hmm. What motivates us, okay, mm -hmm. into action? What are the innate human drives. So this is work that uh, Paul Lawrence uh, at Harvard Business School did before he passed away and I had the opportunity to work with him and, and others uh, on an, a notion that was basically um, a concern that agency theory and the notion of homo economicus was dominant in the narratives and the stories that we were telling business students from Harvard Business School down to other schools. Mm -hmm. And that people would actually then in a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, manifest as Gordon Gecko, as maximizing, etc., as functional psychopaths in a way that ended up in prison most of the time. And if not, then they were doing other kinds of things that would give business a bad name. And that's where we are <laughs> in many ways. The four drives are saying evolutionarily, this is making no sense if we're just maximizing our acquisition needs. Everything that has to be, that is alive uh, has uh, certain basic drives, Paul Lawrence called them the drive to acquire what we need and the drive to defend those things that we need. And those have to be in balance so that we're functional to some degree. Mm -hmm. In addition, uh, human beings have evolved through, let's say, the categories that most of people are familiar, homo habilis, homo erectus, to homo sapiens, by adding a lot of cranial brain infrastructure, so to speak. Uh, and that allowed us um, to, to in, 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 in just to in short, to become a social species and to solve problems together in a collaborative way. We mm -hmm. are fundamentally social and just look at Facebook, <laughs> look mm -hmm. at uh, what you see about nationality and, and tribalism and the racism and the uh, things that are coming up. Those are not individual properties. That is something that is all about us and potentially mm -hmm. versus them. And it's also important to note when we talk about moral, it doesn't mean that we're ethical and always do the right thing, but we care about what the right thing is. We don't necessarily care what more is, but we care what the right thing is. And you can see this currently in the conversations and political uh, dimensions uh, very, very clearly. Uh, and people act against their own self-interests in many ways. <laughs> but what they do uh, care about is that they are part of a tribe, that they're seen as such, that they're part of a social community, and that's what they want to manifest more so than having more stuff more mm -hmm. money, et cetera, et cetera. And that is Homo erectus, and it's sort of like it proven across many dimensions that with fire and with other ways of, of creating the nuclear family, we were able to outperform other species and become sort of part of the dominant species on Earth now. But that truly happened when we then had the, th the fourth independent drive, the drive to comprehend. That's when we added cranial structure, the prefrontal cortex, and we could develop abstract thinking. Uh, so we have four drives, according to Paul Lawrence, the drive to acquire and the drive to defend at the core, plus the drive to bond that is independent, and the drive to comprehend that is also independent. And that's the very critical piece. They're not serving each other. They are mm -hmm. independently necessary for us to be thriving and to be alive. So if we don't feel we're part of a community, we are not happy, no matter how much stuff we have. If we don't feel safe, no matter how much we are part of a community, uh, we, we are not thriving. If we don't have purpose in our life, we're gonna seek it. And if we're not finding purpose, we don't find meaning, then we're gonna be depressed. 
So you have all of these dimensions coming up in us as, as a species, and you have religion as a manifestation of the need to have this comprehensive narrative that makes us make sense of the world. And you can see this anthropologically across the, the, speci uh, the, the cultures that that has happened when we became homo sapiens. And that speci specifically in companies right now, when there is no higher purpose other than acquisition, People mm -hmm. don't feel motivated very much. And if they feel lonely and they feel isolated, it's like the biggest punishment, right? The biggest punishment our species has developed is isolation. Yeah. You be banned. Uh, bullying is a form of isolation. You're not part of us. Mm -hmm. And that hurts psychologically, physically, and, and people rebel against it. So it is a more complex model of understanding human beings, but it has more accuracy according to many, many other insights in terms of how we are actually motivated. And the critical piece is it's not a maximization strategy. We're not mo motivated by maximizing either of the drives. We need to balance them because every time we maximize the drive to acquire, we're going to uh, neglect something else. If we maximize the drive to bond, for example, the Nazis and other sort of in-group, out-group models make that happen, it's also not fit for survival. It typically uh, creates conflict and war and all of those things that lead to death. And the drive to comprehend, if you maximize it, you become ideologues. You only make your uh, sense-making <laughs> matter over others and so you mm -hmm. also maximize that lead to conflict and death same thing with the drive to defend but those are i think uh, very simple ways of distinguishing the homo economicus model as the drive to acquire only mm -hmm. and the other uh, homo sapiens model has four drives that need to be balanced rather than maximized okay okay could we bring now you have explained us who we are as humans and what drives us right uh, can we bring this to the organizational context and as, can you elaborate a little bit more the operating uh, mm -hmm. mechanisms logic balancing etc right and then maybe i'll pull up this slide if that helps okay. Okay. yes yes that's interesting mm -hmm. slide Okay, so this is a little bit of a, a cute picture here, uh, but I, I hope you bear with me. But this is just to really simply uh, share a metaphor. And some of you here may be uh, familiar with uh, Kate Rayworth's work in terms of the donut economics and how we can move into a safe space of organizing. That's at the societal level. Um, but the logics that you're referring, referring to, they, they operate in, in both distinct ways. Uh, there is the bagel model of organizing that matters at the team level, it matters at the organizational level, it matters at societal levels. And the core is dignity, a dignity threshold. We label that dignity threshold the balance of the four drives at, at the minimum level. That's when we need to be alive. We need to be part of something, we need to have purpose, we need to have trusting relationships and uh, we need to have what we need to eat <laughs> and be safe, right? So whenever those minimums aren't met, when there is hunger in the world, et cetera, et cetera, then people live below that dignity threshold. So in order to establish the safe and move people into the safe and just operating zone, which is an organi organizing concept, right? <laughs> That is where operations management, where humanistic management, where all of these, these uh, traditional ways uh, could, could be applied and say, we need to recognize planetary boundaries, which is sort of the outside of that bagel. Uh, there are limits to growth. And within those limits, we can actually live quite well, manage quite well, especially if we get everybody beyond this dignity threshold. So that's an operating logic which is a balancing act ultimately right and that's why we are in business that's why we're teaching <laughs> because it's not something that flies to us naturally it's not like here it is and and we all do it intuitively the uh, the the traditional model however just says well there are no limits there are no limits to growth let's just maximize and that could be your individual maximization so at the organizational level individual maximization of profit or utility is profit maximization, shareholder value maximization, right? 
then you can break that down into the team and the group where you say, all right, here are certain key performance indicators that are related to that. And that's how we organize. We want to maximize those. And at the societal level, we have GDP as the maximization number. And we say, all right, well, we're going to maximize GDP and every, every president or whoever we want to elect <laughs> into office is performing well if they increase GDP and performing poorly if they decrease GDP. And it's well known that GDP as such does not say anything about the quality of life as much. It just says that there is more consumption and investment. Uh, and that could be consumption of, of uh, cancer medicine because everybody is unhealthy and, and needs to get uh, into the hospital. So that's uh, in some way um, to explain the basics of the metaphor. There are, let me just go uh, so here to these, these other logics. Um, uh, if in the economistic model, the objective function, as the economists call it, is wealth, power, or status, or profit maximization, or wealth maximization, or whatever it is, then the logic, of course, underlying all of this is maximizing. Mm -hmm. The uh, humanistic model requires what we call phronesis, practical wisdom. It's like there is no shortcut. It's not like an algorithm. Right now with artificial intelligence, we oftentimes feel like, yeah, people will not be needed anymore because we can just put our uh, objective function into some kind of algorithm the machine will learn and it will spit out the best result for us even though we're not part of it anymore, uh, which is kind of absurd. Uh, but I think the humanistic model allows for humans to play a central role in determining what we actually want to achieve, which I believe, and all philosophers that uh, had thought about this, as well as with the empirical evidence, must be well-being related. Uh, it must be uh, a quality of life related. It must be something that serves the common good. So whatever that may be, that is up for humans to decide. That's where practical wisdom needs to come in, judgment in terms of how you produce things judgment in terms of what you produce and judgment in terms of why you produce it to begin with and those questions are uh, important questions that may or may not be part of the traditional operations management conversation i know that they're not part of the traditional managerial strat st uh, strategy conversation uh, even though now with all the pressures in in society with COVID-19, with uh, the climate crisis and the SDGs and the UN, all of this is, is being questioned and uh, rethought. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have understood the humanistic model. Uh, in academia, the most uh, widely adopted model is the economistic one. So, do you think the humanistic model is viable? And in case it is, can you provide us with some examples of organizations that are using this humanistic model? Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, and much like Eleanor Ostrom, a Nobel laureate in economics, uh, we were doing this research looking at what works not what the theory is and uh, uh, the the interesting surprising thing is that most organizations especially small and uh, medium organizations have to operate with the uh, humanistic model and most startup businesses you can look at google ebay or all of those now big big machines they started out with a very humanistic approach. Uh, they may not have been very aware of it, but that's the only time when it works, when you build community intentionally, when you don't uh, try to uh, cheat people, like Facebook is being accused of, or Google is being accused of. They had uh, those models where do not harm was a baseline of a moral engagement. And now that they're so large and big and they pursued uh, the, the economistic model, even the founders don't want to be part of it anymore, right? The founders resigned and they say, we don't want to be part of that machine. Uh, and you have the EU and, and others sort of say, you are evil. You are not contributing to the common good. At least we need to tax you, if not regulate you massively. Uh, but this is an outcome of a trajectory where they start out with a humanistic approach because it's the fundamentally workable human approach. And most people do it without calling it anything. 
it's just the workable thing. And then it goes into an economistic transformation where it says, okay, well, if you want to grow, you need to pursue these and these things. And some companies say, we don't want to grow. We just want to provide a service. And then they say, all right, you're not really into business or you're not interested for the capital markets. And that's where then finance and the economistic logic comes in, especially when you're up going towards a, a public listing. And that's when Facebook, Google and other of those companies were then always saying, well, you know what? We don't really want to be public. Facebook didn't want to go public uh, and was pushing it out for a long, long time. And Google actually created a very different structure to be public so that the control would be in the hands of the founders. But that has then been diluted in, in other ways, uh, been uh, circumvented so that the logic of the quote unquote publicly listed market, the economistic logic was taking uh, home. So you were saying examples, there are many examples, um, but uh, if, if we're looking at Europe or Spain or many of those organizations, cooperatives are fundamentally humanistically oriented mm -hmm. uh, and they're oftentimes given no attention in business schools, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't fit the logic of homo economicus. They don't feel, fit the logic of the economistic narrative of what success is. Uh, they stay regional, they stay small, they create well-being through jobs and quality of work and, and quality products, but it's not an interesting growth model where an MBA could come in and just adopt all the kind of um, uh, calculations uh, that, that, we, that we offer uh, to them. There is much more skill needed to be working in those kinds of organizations. Okay, but do you think we can provide the humanistic approach to the big organizations, to the large organizations, Michael? I, th I think it's absolutely necessary. That's the human quest right now. We have at the global level, the UN SDGs, and that's basically a reversion to saying, you know what, uh, growth in itself doesn't matter. There needs to be a quality. So more is not better. We want better and the definition of better is the 17 goals. You see that Global Compact and, and other organizations really shift. You see Larry Fink, the financier uh, in charge of a $7 trillion fund say, you know what, you need to have a social purpose beyond profit maximization CEOs in America, the business round table statement in America also uh, saying that we at least need to pay lip service to a humanistic model, which is whatever some others call stakeholder capitalism or some of these things. But um, in the end, that's where society is. If we don't get that beast under control, we're, we're not surviving. And we have it in control. We, we, are, uh, we can shift the way that we use the tools that we have developed. It's operations management, other forms of management, and they can just be deployed in a different context with a different purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then what can we do as academics in business schools or in another type of institutions when we are teaching subjects like operations management? What do you think we could do? Well, I think in the end, the tools, as I was saying, are probably not going to be that different. You can achieve operations, uh, oper uh, operating efficiencies and effectivenesses with a different purpose and say, maybe we want to create these kinds of products. We want to invest in quality solutions to, let's say, the climate crisis. We have all the technological knowledge that we need to produce them. So how and why were we not doing it? Why are we not scaling those up? Where and how could we do these kinds? Of things I think that we can do a lot in that uh, transition I think the the best potential thing is that we should uh, do is is we should undo this um, cage of the economistic paradigm mm -hmm. that in many business schools still we basically tacitly provide a blueprint of this narrative that success is more and that success is money <laughs> And that success is wealth and status and power. And uh, we have all the evidence uh, in terms of that people that come into business school typically are just like normal human beings. There may be a self-selection effect of those that want to be more richer or whatever, something like that. But that once they go through our training, which is very successful, we have to agree and admit, is they become less social. They become more like homo economicus. They become less concerned with the common good. They become less concerned with, with anything social. 
And so this is, I think, the best thing that we could do is undo that and offer students at least two perspectives. It's like, okay, here's, an, here's one that's dominant and here's an alternative one that works also or maybe better. And then I think we were talking about this before, it's like a bilingual. We should give them two languages, right? And then we should allow them to be translators between because they're gonna see the reality of one or the other and then they may be able to decide for themselves where and how they want to contribute. And I would take a bet that 99% of the students, or let's say 90% of the students, or it could be say 80% of the students, would prefer to work in a humanistic model, uh, would prefer to contribute meaningfully to the common good, not by sacrificing themselves, which we oftentimes do in the old narrative. It's like, no, you can't have any money. You can't have any safety. You can't ha have any of these things if you want to be, have meaningful work. Uh, you need to be poor, uh, et cetera, and you need to work for an NGO. And uh, ideally you have a rich wife or husband if you want anything else from life. So I think if we can just dispel that myth, uh, we would do a good service to our students. And I think operations management and all the other disciplines uh, can do a very, very important uh, part of that. Um, so he's, he's trying to bring what you are teaching in the business ethics course to all courses, right? Because right. Uh, well, so I'm not teaching this in a business ethics course because I think that's been the problem of the dominant model is that we outsource this to a business ethics course. It needs to be fundamental, like, as we said, with the humanistic model of human nature, we are fundamentally moral everywhere, right? That means we're not necessarily doing the best uh, decision for everybody, but we're concerned about what the best decision is. So we wanna know what's better. And then we typically can actually make better decisions that way. And uh, so yeah, that I, I agree. This can be part of any of any discipline in in business and beyond. Uh, do you want to do? Do you want to know what I have been doing in my OM course? Well, yeah, I, I would be very, very curious how this, how this, how this resonates with you at all, because it typically could be seen like this is, this is nonsense. This makes no sense. Um, and and I'm, I'm, uh, we have had a conversation before, etc. But I'm, I'm curious, like, where, what do you think resonates, and what is it that that may make sense in operations management, the way that you teach it, the way that you mm -hmm. see it? Because I, I, I know that Isada is is deeply. Uh, uh, involved in, in transform, transforming its curriculum also through this, uh, through this value-based lens that, um, uh, that uh, the four C's that you mentioned before are, are providing. Yeah, I, I, I shared in the introductions where you were not in, in the conversation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I shared with them uh, that we have been working for more than a year in a task force, okay, within the International Association of Jesuit Universities, on rethinking business education, right? So I've been inspired by Michael and many other people in the, in the task force and more colleagues at the SADE. And uh, before, before entering into the detail about how, how I try to incorporate this in, in a typical OM course, I think Michael could be interesting to share with the, with the audience uh, what are uh, what is uh, our identity? Uh, Michael works, as I introduced him before, in Fordham University. I work in, a, in Esade. Both uh, are Jesuit business schools. Okay, so we share, despite we work in different institutions, we shared a common identity and a common mission, right? So we, we share some um, pedagogical uh, tradition okay and the mission the education the educational mission that we have is to prepare uh, to educate people and we put a lot of emphasis on people on the human being to train people to become professionals who are highly competent so they know a lot about operations management marketing etc but who are also uh, socially committed okay and to achieve this we believe that uh, we need to develop uh, in our students, we, we need to develop four, type, four types of uh, mega competencies. I'm gonna share with you the screen. 
okay? So, um, the four competencies that our pedagogical model tries to develop with our students is consciousness, compassion, commitment, and competence, okay? Uh, we call these the four C's, okay? What does consciousness mean? Uh, consciousness means awareness. We try to develop in our students the capability to be aware. To be aware of what? To be aware of what's around them, what are the main uh, challenges that our society is facing, okay? But consciousness is also related with the inner, uh, with the self-awareness, okay? What are our drives as, as a human being and what are uh, the implications of our decisions on others? What are the drives that motivate us into action, etc. Okay, so external awareness and self-awareness. Then another competence that is key to develop commitment is compassion, okay? Compassion is related with being, a, to, is a, related with uh, empathize with others, being able to, to care about others, about the suffering of others, okay? So if you are conscious and you are compassionate, okay, you care about the suffering of others, this, it, this usually moves you into action, uh, getting committed uh, to, to implement change to improve the life of other people, okay? And then um, the other mega competence is to be highly competent, okay? To have the skills and, and the knowledge needed to uh, get committed to introduce uh, social, political change, etc. To develop these four competencies, we usually use a, a, a pedagogical model where context is very important, okay? And context refers uh, to understand where the student is situated, okay? Then, or, uh, or approach to teaching is based on experiential learning, okay? And experiential learning has the advantage that covers uh, the cognitive part, okay, knowing, but it also involves uh, emotional, okay? Emotional and affective, uh, affective uh, meaning. And then, okay, we consider context, experience, and after the experience, there is always the need to consider reflection. And reflection entail, um, entails or refers uh, to make our students think and grasp the deep meaning of what they have experienced, okay? Uh, it's very important that the, there is reflection after experience, okay, in order to be, to, de to develop this consciousness, okay? Uh, and then, after this reflection, there is action, okay? So this means uh, making a decision, uh, implementing something, etc. okay? So our pedagogical approach, what we do in our courses, is based on these four dimensions, okay? Context, experience, reflection, and action to make our students be conscious, compassionate, and committed, and highly competent also, okay? So this, we share this, okay? I want to stop sharing, okay. So we, we as Jesuit Business School, we share this, uh, this uh, type of professional that we want to develop, and this type of pedagogical approach, okay? So taking that into account, what I'm trying to do in my, in my course. So for example, in, in, in a typical operations management course, okay, what I try to do is to develop awareness. Okay, so I try to put emphasis on the fact that, my, that the students need to understand, 
It's a very experiential approach based on cases of real projects, okay? And I try to make them be aware of the context where um, they need to make uh, some decisions or apply some, some knowledge or tools, okay? So being aware, okay, of the context, being aware of all the, um, all the values that are implicit on all decisions. So for example, if we are uh, analyzing, for example, uh, a typical uh, production uh, plan, okay? Uh, when, we, when we need to choose uh, uh, how to balance supply and demand, there are, for example, different alternatives. No? You can use a chase strategy and try to produce uh, according to a peak, and then if there is a, a valley and there is not so much demand, you reduce production, okay? And you try to adapt the human resources, okay? Uh, the number of employees that you have to these needs in production. This is a, a, a typical strategy we call the chase strategy, okay? Another strategy, it's a balanced one, okay? You keep producing more or less, always the same. Have and balance uh, and try to cover peaks, anticipating these peaks, producing more before and stocking, okay? So when, uh, when the students need to to make a decision about uh, how to balance supply and demand, okay? Uh, what I ask them is to consider uh, different, different variables that may be affected by each one of these strategies, okay? One of the, one, the typical, um, the typical case puts a lot of emphasis on cost. Okay, on efficiency and says the costs related with this strategy are inventory costs, hire people, firing, training people, etc. And, and then uh, students um, see that everything can be reduced to a number. But, but what I introduce, okay, is okay, in addition to this cost, okay, can we consider other dimensions, for example? Is it better to keep more or less uh, always during the, the, the whole year the same number of employees, the same employees you establish a long-term relationship with them? What are the advantages of this in addition, or in addition to cost? What are the advantages? So try to make them uh, be aware not only about the traditional measures, but other measures, okay? Well-being, and also, okay, in addition, in addition to, to this um, rational approach, okay, because considering all these variables would be a rational approach, okay? Despite I may ask them to consider other variables in addition to cost, this is a rational approach. But then I try to bring their emotional part, okay? And ask how they feel, okay? And we try to incorporate in our discussions feelings, okay? So how do you think people would feel? How would you feel as a manager if you see that these people are feeling this way, okay? So trying to, uh, to uh, complement rationality with emotional and, affect, and affectiveness, okay? Affective, okay? Uh, and, and this can be providing, putting the students, okay, something to stress. Uh, I try to put, uh, to put the students in the learning as a first person, okay? So they, they, take, um, they take a very active uh, position through the course. So they are confronted to decisions in all the topics we are analyzing, okay? confronted to decisions, so that means they have to make a decision, first person, is not firms do this, uh, operations managers do that, no, you are a, an operations manager or a logistics manager or whatever, and you need to make such, some decisions, okay? And first person, what are all the values implicit when you are making a decision? 
uh, what are the implications of your decisions on others and try to incorporate feelings. Okay, let me think, uh, let me review if I'm missing something. So I'm trying to make them aware and trying to make them compassionate by trying to involve um, these emotional and these feelings. Okay, and, uh, and then when uh, they make uh, decisions, okay, when they have arrived into action, okay, if they have not been creative enough to provide solutions that can, in, that can be cost, if balance cost with this more humanistic approach, I try to see, I try to bring into the class some examples of firms that have been able to do that, to open their eyes, okay? So more or less is uh, this what I'm doing, but I'm in the journey, Michael, of uh, incorporating more things, okay? So if you have uh, some comments about it, let me, let me know. Yeah, I thank you, thank you. That's very interesting, and I, I love the, the 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 small little shift in a way, like you're saying, the first person, and also just the awareness, the context setting, and all that stuff. That's very helpful to just sort of position it in in the bigger conversation, and um, and I think. Uh, what I, what I can't give is specific recommendations to anybody in operations management just because I'm not, I'm not feeling uh, confident enough about <laughs> any of the, the domains. Uh, on the other hand, I think what, what might be helpful is just exactly that, what you're saying, is like putting that into a context that is a social context. It's not a technological context. It's a context where people are operating, where students are people and are managing and are making decisions for people as well. And so this context setting, uh, and I, I would of course suggest always like this, these narrative stories that are options, right? Because we're, we're always gonna have to somehow shift more towards, okay, now it's a time for effectiveness and efficiency and we're gonna try to cut costs because otherwise we would not be able to survive. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong inherently with that. It's actually great. It's perfect. It's wonderful. It's, uh, it's, um, it's beautiful in many ways. If, especially if, if it's connected and built on the, the third E, which is the ethics piece. So we tend to view the context typically around efficiency and effectiveness. So it's the how we do things and what we do, but never really why we do it to begin with. Mm -hmm. I think that is the ethics question. And so if you can build it and start what you teach from there, why are you producing these products? Why are you doing this? All right, okay. Then what do you wanna achieve specifically and how do you get there? I think then you have an integrated perspective of, of operations management and other pieces as well. And I think the problem that we're facing right now, we, we think we have given the why, the answer to the why. It's, we want more, mm -hmm. that's it, more. Okay, all right, let's go now, let's do more. But that's, that's sort of increasingly mm -hmm. dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, for sharing this, uh, this uh, conversation with us. Thank you all, all the audience for listening to us, for your passions, okay? Hope we have tried to inspire you to try to introduce a little bit the humanistic narrative, a little bit in the different, in the different courses. And uh, if you have any questions or would like to contact us, feel free to do that, okay? Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you.